Yep. So it's a great pleasure to have Professor uh, Shumit Ranjan Das in our QASTM seminar series. It is probably the 60 and six, 16th uh, seminar series. And uh, uh, Professor Das is right now at Kentucky University. Before he was at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And yeah, like uh, there, we have some time overlap when I was doing my postdoc. And uh, he's an expert in uh, the area of quantum quench and its application in quantum field theories. And today he will give us a broad overview on this subject. So the title of the talk is Quantum Quench and Emergent Space Time. So Professor Das, you can start right now. Okay, thank you for <clears throat> inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I don't know how broad an overview I'll be able to give because I'll, uh, I will uh, concentrate on some, some very aspect. specific aspects of quantum quench, but I will introduce the subject and say enough about it for, uh, for the uh, benefits of the audience who are not exposed to this area. So in quantum field theory, quantum quench refers to a process where we have a system which is initially in some nice state and then it is driven by a time dependent coupling. This is a very popular way of addressing questions in non-equilibrium physics, both theoretically and experimentally. Our main interest in this talk is in field theories which are related to gravitational theories by a holographic correspondence where we will see that the quantum quench of the field theory becomes dual to time dependent geometries and these may provide ways of addressing difficult issues in the latter as you would imagine this is an efficient way to produce excited states in quantum many body systems and typically you have a uh, one starts with the ground state of an initial time independent Hamiltonian and then one has a coupling which is time dependent which takes the system to another time independent Hamiltonian. So here this lambda of t is the coupling. In the Heisenberg picture, so the state is the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian and obviously it's not the ground state of the new Hamiltonian it's a complicated excited state of the new Hamiltonian and we uh, would so like I to have learn. A question. Sure. So, since you have mentioned about a time dependent coupling, so yes. uh, any kind of behavior of time dependent coupling is allowed here? Any arbitrary? I mean, of course you can write down a Hamiltonian with anything. We are interested in time dependent couplings which asymptote to constant values at early and late times. Okay. In the middle it can do anything it likes. Okay, okay. And it shouldn't blow up or anything. I mean, it's all bounded. Okay. 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 And we would like to know some broad features of this excited state. Uh, should the question? Suppose we have a situation where. <laughs> yeah, please uh, ask. Hello. Yeah, please ask. The question yeah Shumita, this is krishnandu uh, just a question uh, so suppose i can i incur, i mean within this frame, muscle. is it possible to incorporate oscillatory dynamics uh, that doesn't asymptote to some constant value at late I'm, times i'm sorry I, your, your 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 voice is not coming through maybe you can so There's maybe a your in the background something is working. So maybe either TV or maybe something. So just switch it off and then. Uh, 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 okay, is it better now? Yes, it's better now. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I was wondering is that uh, a class of coupling which is like the oscillatory time dependence, you know, where it doesn't uh, assemble to a constant at late and early times, could that be? Right. 
within this uh, formalism or is it a different class altogether it it's a slightly different class those are driven systems and they are, they are called uh, they lead to very interesting non equilibrium behavior called floke systems or uh, time crystals uh, i will not deal with those i mean i'm i'm dealing with things you really have co couplings which uh, which have a time dependence over a limited period of time okay thank you yeah so suppose we start out with a uh, suppose our system has an energy gap so the initial hamiltonian has an energy gap to begin with and the quench rate is slow in uh, compared to this energy gap so lambda not is a coupling i mean i've used a notation which is uh, the, which is useful in conformal field theory uh, d is the dimensionality of uh, of of the space time and delta is the dimension of an operator which is being quenched so this lambda not raised to the that power has dimensions of length so you have a delta t which is the uh, which is the which is the time over which the coupling changes is large compared to this in such a situation uh, normal that the initial time evolution is adiabatic what this means in particular is that if the state is the ground state of the initial hamiltonian it remains close to the ground state of the instantaneous hamiltonian however interesting physics happens when the time evolution takes the system close to a critical point so here is an example of how you would do it so I, if you have an action there is a critical action and a uh, a deformation of the critical action which is not not small in general which is some operator with some time dependent coupling and when that coupling is zero you the instantaneous action is the critical action so that's a critical theory and these are you know some representative uh, time uh, evolutions of this coupling and you know the point at which the the theory becomes critical at the points when these lambdas become zero so uh, one more thing i just want to ask so like sudden transitions are not allowed like heavy side function i'll, I'll come to that that's a special case of this oh okay okay <laughs> so in such a situation since a critical point means a gapless point so the instantaneous gap of the system is decreasing as the system approaches this critical point so what one would expect is that at some time before the system actually hits a critical point adiabaticity gets broken and the system gets excited there is a there is a standard uh, uh, procedure of how to obtain this breakdown of adiabaticity Uh, the time at which it happens is called the kibble zurek time and it is determined by what is called a landau criterion which 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 tells you that the rate of time dependence of the instantaneous gap becomes of the same order as the gap square because in this equation this left hand side is of course the what is the quantity that controls the adiabatic approximation you can for typical e critical systems in equilibrium the gap would scale as some power of the coupling the power is given by this product of z and nu nu is the standard uh, equilibrium correlation length exponent z is the dynamical critical exponent and see if lambda has a form which is some overall lambda zero times some some function and which is which goes as some power of the of this of this quantity the, at at near t equal to zero then the energy gap would scale as some power of delta t which is given by this equation now if you substitute this in here what you would find is the kibble zurek time that would scale as again some power of delta t what would mean this would mean that the instantaneous correlation length namely the correlation length which is evaluated at that time would also scale as some power of delta t and the point is that these powers as 
you can explicitly see are universal quantities. So there is a large class of Hamiltonians within the same universality class which share these exponents. Now, once the adiabaticity is broken, there are very few theoretical tools to analyze the problem. So back in the 1970s, Kibble and Zurek made a drastic simplifying assumption. Kibble and Zurek was interested in this problem in the context of the expanding universe where the, you know, the, the, the expansion of the universe can be, it can be thought of giving rise to time dependence of various couplings in the theory. And in, in, and in such a situation, what they assumed is that soon after the adiabaticity is broken, the system becomes diabetic. What that means is that the, that the system just becomes frozen. Namely, at the kibble zurek time, after all, the energy gap has become quite small and the system is, the, the couplings are changing at a rate which is pretty fast compared to this, this instantaneous energy gap. So to a very, very crude approximation, the system doesn't really have any time to respond to this change. So that is, an, a, that is what is called a diabetic evolution. Then in the critical region, which is a region which is given between these two red lines, observed point functions would remain roughly frozen. However, we know that at, at, at this time where the adiabaticity got broken, it's just at the edge of adiabatic approximation. So the adiabatic approximation still holds. So one can calculate these various quantities, for example, the correlation length at this time. And by assumption, if you assume further that pretty much like in equilibrium critical phenomena, there is only one scale in the problem, in this case, the scale given by the correlation length, then you can immediately derive that the one point function would scale as some power of delta t, which is given by this exponent. This is an example of kibble zurek scaling this is the scaling which one observes in the early time behavior of quantum quench. What happens at late times? Generic systems at late times, generic non systems which are not integrable, at late times, one would expect that the system thermalizes. Of course, if you start with a pure state, it never really becomes a thermal ensemble. However, for restricted classes of observables, uh, it's a very good approximation that the, the, the state generic ex typical excited state of the system pretty much behaves like a thermal state. This statement is made more accurate by what is called the, what is called ETH or the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, but I will not go into the details of this. If the system is integrable, you would imagine that nothing particular happens, but rather surprisingly, it turns out that very often the system tends to what is called a generalized Gibbs ensemble. What this means is that a system being integrable means that there are a large number of conserved charges. So what a generalized Gibbs ensemble means is that the the quantities which are held fixed in the ensemble are not only the Hamiltonian or the energy, but all values of all these conserved charges. With, so if you want to write it in a canonical form, they'll come with some chemical potentials which are conjugate to these conserved charges. <clears throat> this kind of behavior uh, is seen in a very large variety of systems and can almost be proven in in systems which are quenched to a critical point, at least in low dimensions. So this was the story when the quench was slow compared to the initial gap. Let me now go to the other extreme, which is an abrupt or instantaneous quench. Here, a Hamiltonian suddenly changed from one Hamiltonian to another Hamiltonian. So what this means is that if you have a state 
the state really doesn't change in the process and and all it does is that for the time evolution after the quench the initial state in the schrodinger picture just just behaves like an initial condition for solving the schrodinger equation the solution is obtained by a standard time independent final hamiltonian when such a quench happens from a gapped to a critical hamiltonian there are another set of universal results which are known particularly in one plus one dimensions and a significant fact is that for purposes of long distance behavior the heisenberg picture state is very well approximated by what is called a calabrese cardi state where uh, this is sort of technical things uh, uh, that in this case uh, this state b is a particular state of the final particular class of states of the final uh, conformal field theory which are called boundary states and what we have here is an exponential of some the scale multiplied by the final hamiltonian again this this approximation to the quent state undergoes changes for integrable systems where this exponential is replaced by the suitable quantity which is analogous to what we had for the generalized gibbs ensemble again at late times for suitable observables this behaves like a thermal state with a temperature which is roughly the inverse of that scale which appears in the exponent uh, one question uh, yeah. at the point of uh, the quench when the transition happened there the solution in both the sides has to match surely yeah of course okay. i mean you, because you're solving a schrodinger equation so you know yeah the matching conditions have yeah 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 okay <laughs> so let me now come to holographic setups for these quantum quenches starting with the the probably the the better known versions of holography namely the ads cft correspondence in the ads cft correspondence a quantum quench becomes a time dependent boundary condition in the bulk just to uh, just to recall if I have a scalar operator in the dual bulk theory that is dual to a bulk field phi and the asymptotics of the bulk field here I have used an, an, an ADS metric in the in Poincare coordinates. Then the asymptotic behavior of this field is is the standard form these are the two linearly independent solutions of the uh, of the of the wave equation in the bulk and as it's very well known the the non normalizable mode is identified with the coupling of the theory so this lambda is the same lambda which appeared in the previous slides whereas the coefficient of the normalizable mode is identified with the response namely the expectation value of the operator which is dual to this field phi so the problem becomes the following it becomes a problem in the limit where the the area safety correspondence actually becomes a correspondence between a classical gravity dual and a strongly coupled quantum field theory on the boundary what you need to do is to have a time dependent boundary condition you solve the equations of motion and once you have the equations of motion, you can extract out of it the asymptotics, the subleading asymptotics, which is given by this term, and that gives you the response. And of course, there are there are of course similar ways of calculating other things like correlation functions. This approach has been, in fact, quite fruitful in the past several years. And let me just tell you a few things. What which. Uh, some of the new things which one has learned uh, out of this uh, out of this experience this has thrown light on the physics of kibble zurek scaling this has led to new dynamical phases which have been discovered in models of holographic superconductors it has led to new universal scaling in an in intermediate fast quench regime which is the regime where the time scale of the quench is 
much smaller than the inverse gap, but much larger than the ultraviolet cutoff of the theory. And in this case it, case, it turns out, and the first indications came from holography, namely there is a scaling of operators, again, universal scaling of operators. And it later turned out that this universal scaling has really nothing much to do with holography, but turns out to be a property of any quantum field theory, regardless of holography. Perhaps more significantly, holography has also led to considerable light into thermalization. So let me discuss this aspect. So as I said, in ADS-CFT, a quantum quench is like a time-dependent boundary condition. You can think of a time-dependent boundary condition as an injection of energy from the boundary of ADS. So here I've drawn a global piece of ADS, which is like a tin can, the, the surface of the can is the boundary. You start out with the space, which is just, say for example, ADS, which represents a ground state of the, of the field theory. And then you have a time dependent boundary condition, which, which lasts for a very sm uh, some small time. So what it does, it sort of injects some energy. I've assumed that it is homogeneous in space in this particular case. So it is sort of sending out little waves from the boundary to the interior. And you have to look at what happens with these waves. Now the bulk is a theory of gravity. So the most likely thing that would happen is that these waves collapse. They mutually collapse and they form black holes. Once a black hole is formed, then it sort of starts hawking, radiating, and this being an ADS space, which is like a space with a boundary, the radiation reflects back from the boundary and eventually it leads to equilibrium of the black hole with some radiation outside. So if one would measure any observable outside the horizon of the black hole, those observables would behave thermally with the Hawking temperature of the black hole, which has been formed. So therefore, it means that black hole formation is dual to thermalization of the field theory. If the quench injects enough energy or energy rate, the local observables thermalize very quickly, which was observed in very early studies of, of such a quantum quench in ADS-CFT. When the energy is not large enough, then a black hole does not form immediately. Rather, these waves which are thrown in from the boundary bounce back and forth some multiple number of times and leads to a very interesting set of physics. And it is sort of believed that for generic situations, after many such bouncing back, a black, black holes are eventually formed. However, there are also classes of initial conditions for the black holes are not formed. And what are formed are things which are called boson stars. It turns out, however, there are also some classes of time dependent boundary conditions which do not lead to black holes, but lead to cosmological space times, typically containing space like of null regions of high, sometimes infinite curvature. This appears at times when the field theory coupling is small. So therefore the dual theory uh, is expected to be very strongly coupled. So the hope of these studies in the, in the past decade has been that this holo these are, go by the name of holographic cosmologies, is that while the bulk gravity theory surely fails in this region, the low energy effective theory surely fails, a field theory with a time dependent coupling may provide a perfectly fine time evolution. And in fact, there are indeed some cases where such a smooth time evolution is likely. However, in most interesting cases, these results are rather inconclusive and the nature of the Heisenberg picture state uh, remains uh, rather mysterious. So, uh, so we thought one, one question. So, for yeah. this holographic cosmology, 
the sign of the cosmological constant is also negative yeah it's it's in ads holographic cosmology that's correct. but uh, you are calling cosmology because it's the couplings are time dependent and evolving probably well, from the bulk point of view, uh, it, you do have uh, like uh, like space-like singularities. In that sense, it's a. Oh, uh, okay. I can understand. Yeah, it, you can think of it more like a big crunch. Whether it okay, leads okay. to a big bang yeah, later yeah. or not, it's a it's a difficult issue to decide. No, I have asked because like there are students as well because they don't know. That's why. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it would be good to have solvable toy models of holography where such quantum quench can be studied on both sides of the holography. So in this talk, what we will do, we'll explore this problem in, uh, in such a solvable model, which is called matrix quantum mechanics, which I'll describe, which happens to be the holographic dual description of two dimensional string theory. So maybe I pause uh, for some questions before I go on to this. Please ask questions because he's uh, transiting to something else. So up to this point, if you have any question, please ask. Unmute yourself and ask. Okay, so let me proceed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give a lightning review of the matrix model string theory duality. This is a very old subject, so, so many of you may not be quite familiar with this. So what one starts with is a large, it's a large N by N matrix, a single matrix, which is just a function of time. So there is an action, which has a uh, Kinetic is the action is invariant under the UN symmetry of this Hermitian matrix problem. Uh, it has a, an, a coupling, which I call beta, which is actually the, if you rescale this out, it's, it's, a, it's a quadric coupling M, M to the fourth. This is G is the etuft coupling of the theory, which is held fixed in the large N limit. And I have started writing it out with some generic potential which has a quadratic term and a quadric term and so on. Okay. Now, this is a very, this is a very difficult problem to solve in its entirety. However, it's a problem which is solvable in what is called the singlet sector of the theory. The singlet sector of the theory is something uh, which you obtain by restricting all the states in the theory to be singlets. The really good way of doing this is actually to gauge the UN symmetry, which is in the problem. So this derivative actually becomes a covariant derivative of, of the matrix square. So the covariant derivative has a gauge field in it. But in one dimension, a gauge field only leads to a constraint the constraint being uh, the constraint being like a gauss law constraint and if you look at the, typically a gauss law constraint tells you that gauss law the the left hand side of gauss law is a generator of of small gauge transformations so what the constraint then tells you as you would expect is that all the states are gauge invariant in this case they are really singlets it was realized long time ago in the early 1980s in a classic paper by Breza, Itzikson, Parisi, and Zubair that in the singlet sector, of course, in the singlet sector, uh, uh, you, you should try to go to variables which are invariant under this UN symmetry. And the invariant variables are obviously the eigenvalues. You have a single matrix, so you can use the UN symmetry to, to diagonalize, this, uh, diagonalize this matrix. It's like choosing a gauge in this, uh, in this problem, uh, fixing the, the remaining gauge symmetry. And for reasons which I'll not go into, 
it turns out that this change of variables from the matrix to the eigenvalues leads to a measure of integrations. And what the measure of integration does is to make these eigenvalues behave like positions of n fermions. There are n fermions, n eigenvalues. So we have a problem of n fermions <coughs> whose locations are given by these eigenvalues. Now, so I have an, a many body system, n particles, and which are moving on a line because lambda, the value, the lambda can, you know, go over the real line in this particular case. So another way of writing the problem is using second quantization to write it in terms of a fermion field. And that's what I have done here. Chi is a fermion field. And all I have done is to write the Hamiltonian, which follows from this action after this diagonalization. And in, in a standard form, this is the kinetic term of the fermion. This is the potential which comes from that potential. And this is a term which is uh, which imposes the condition. So you can think of mu f as a Lagrange multiplier, which imposes the condition that the total number of fermions is n. So there is an additional beta mu f n here, which I have just removed because that's it's a constant. Mu f, therefore, is the chem is like a chemical potential, or I'll call the Fermi level of this fermion. Now there is a very interesting limit called the double scaling limit, which people realized again in the early 1990s. And what this limit does is to take n to infinity. So uh, n appears in in this parameter beta. G is you, you can uh, think of G as the as the Etoff coupling. So you take n to infinity, which results in beta going to infinity and take the Fermi level to zero with a combination of the Fermi level and the beta held fixed. So I'll call this, this will appear as a string coupling of the theory. So I'll denote it by GS. In this limit, the problem simplifies considerably. And this can be seen by a, a certain redefinition of this variable lambda and the variable x by, by what I've written here. And it turns out that if you work it through, so use these variables, consider this limit. In the original problem, I had a quadratic term, a quartic term, and maybe m to the sixth or you know what have you. And all that survived is that quadratic term. So what do you have? is a bunch of fermions moving in an inverted harmonic oscillator potential. It is useful to think of the duality. It is useful to introduce what is called a bosonic collective field. It is nothing but the density of these eigenvalues, which is, of course, the density of fermions. This is defined by this equation. You can think of it as a bosonization of this fermion. And in the classical limit of small gs, of this particular gs, which is held fixed in this limit, it's very easy to write down what is the action of, uh, of, this, of this variable, that, which I'll call the collective field. It turns out that you can make a change of variables to this collective field, even at the quantum level, order by order in the one upon n expansion. That has a name of collective field theory, which was uh, written by, by Jeviki and Saketa also in the early 1980s. But we will not need the entire technology of the collective field theory for the purposes of this talk. So what I've written down for you is the action for these bosonic collective variables. As you can see, it's a rather unconventional uh, action. Uh, you can see that the, the kinetic term is, is sort of very strange. It has a cubic coupling. And this term here is nothing, is the, is the remnant of the term, which is the Lagrange, the potential and the Lagrange multiplier for the fermions. 
it is significant that this combination GS square appears as the coupling of this theory. So this is why the classical limit of the theory is in fact small GS. And we are going to try to understand the theory in, in an expansion in powers of GS. So the first thing which we need to do is to find a classical saddle point of this problem. And the saddle point solution is given very easily. I mean, the lowest energy of this problem, uh, configuration of this problem will come when this field zeta is independent of time. And then it is trivial to solve the saddle point equation. And the equation is given uh, and the solution is given by this. And like in any other quantum field theory, what you would do is to expand around the saddle point. And that's what I have done. I've also made a new, uh, a slight change of variables to a new coordinate Q, which is defined by X equal to cos Q. And doing all this, you write down the fluctuation Lagrangian, the Lagrangian for this field eta. And I've written down for you the full fluctuation Lagrangian. As you can see quite explicitly, from the kinetic term of this Lagrangian, this eta is a massless, is a relativistic massless scalar, which is moving in a metric, which is conformally flat. Okay. This is a massless scalar in one plus one dimension. One of the dimensions was the original time, and the other dimension has sort of emerged from the space of eigenvalues, which was X, and now I have made a, just a change to go it into Q. The coupling of the theory is space dependent. So these are the cubic terms. These are, these are the couplings of the theory. And you can see that the overall power, overall factor here depends on Q, therefore it depends on X. So this is a theory with a coupling constant, which is spatially non-homogeneous. This is probably the earliest example of a space direction, which has emerged out of the large n degrees of freedom. So I call it the earliest example of holography, which predates ADS-CFT by many years. It's holography in the sense that we started out with a zero plus one dimensional theory with n squared degrees of freedom. And it becomes equivalent to a one plus one dimensional theory, which doesn't have n squared degrees of freedom, which is an order one degrees of freedom. In this particular case, it's just one degree of freedom, which is this field, which is eta. This is the bulk description of the theory. This field eta is identified, in fact, with the single dynamical degree of freedom of string theory in two dimensions. To summarize, we have a first quantized description in terms of n fermions. This is quantum mechanics of n fermions. I'll call that the holographic description. Then we have a second quantized description which is in terms of a fermionic or a bosonic field. And therefore that lives in one plus one dimensions. And in this particular limit, the significant fact is that the dynamics of this boson, even though the fermions were non-relativistic, the dynamics of this, this collective field is relativistic one plus in one plus one dimensions. This is why it is, well, this was a necessary ingredient for, uh, for this to able to be describing two-dimensional string theory, which is obviously Lorentz invariant. The fermions are in an external potential. They're mutually non-interacting, and this provides an exact formulation of the theory. It turns out to do a set of interesting development in the in the early, in the 2004 2005 when people revisited this problem that this duality can also be expressed in terms of an open string closed string duality 
However, it is not quite like ADS CFT. It is open stream, closed stream, in the sense that there are a set of D brains in two dimensional string theory, and it's a duality of the degrees of freedom of the D brains with the closed strings in the bulk. And in fact, a precise evidence for this duality was found already in the 1990s. There was a precise uh, calculation of the S matrix of scattering in this theory, which was, if it was in complete agreement with what one got from two the world sheet methods of two dimensional string theory. Recently, there has been very interesting developments where this evidence has in fact been strengthened to include non perturbative effects. In fact, I think uh, an hour from now, there is a talk by Ashok Sen somewhere on, on this problem. Ashok, the one question. Yeah. yeah so in, in, in the bosonization, is the exclusion built in? Because this is, these are fermions. Exclusion means? Uh, yeah. Means do the, means does it, uh, does the operator raise to some power because there are a finite number of states no no it is not built in and that's what creates a, that's what a non trivial fact so when you go to finite n right mm -hmm. uh, you uh, i mean the the fact that phi is not this 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 field phi is not really a full fledged scalar it sort of appears in the fact that if we write um, a good basis for the phi's, this basis in terms of the matrices are actually uh, represented in terms of Schur polynomials, which actually form a representation of the, uh, what group, the permutation group. And uh, because they are representations of the permutation group, the number of independent such uh, these polynomials are in fact bounded. I mean, because, you know, young tableaus end after n in boxes that part is not built into this description this these effects actually come in an important and interesting way when you start looking at finite n effects I see. but i'll but, not deal with that but these s matrix uh, it was not important for the s matrix for the s matrix it was not this was working strictly in this large n you know n equal to infinity limit hmm. I mean, this would become, the, you know, as you said, the stringy exclusion principle in the bulk. Mm -hmm. uh, Sumit, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you said that this uh, problem in terms of eigenvalues were mapped to the fermion problem. So, are you assuming that there is um, no degeneracy in the spectrum? Is that... Yeah, it's a one-dimensional problem. So typically, there's no degeneracy. There, there is a, I mean, in a certain limit, uh, there is a degeneracy. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, the potential is like this, this inverted harmonic oscillator potential. So if you ignore yes. tunneling, then there is a degeneracy because there are two sides of the potential. Yeah. But the exact problem, of course, cannot have any degeneracy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let me describe the physics of this problem in, in terms of a picture in phase space, which was uh, you know, invented by Polchinski, again, back in the 1990s. So the left part of this diagram is a phase space, single particle phase space of the fermions of the theory. And I have drawn the Fermi surfaces because it's an inverted potential so the Fermi surface is like P square minus X squared equal to something. So all these states are filled out here. If I take a line of constant X, it intersects generically the Fermi surface as two points, which I call P plus and P minus. There are, to begin with, two Fermi surfaces corresponding to fermions which are living on the left side and fermions which are living on the right side. And uh, a, a little thought tells you that if I take the difference of this and that, what you get is the density of fermions. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple one line exercise to show if you start with the phase space density of fermions, the integral of the phase space density over the momentum uh, is given by the position space density. 
but in this classical limit, uh, uh, the the phase space density is like a theta is, is either zero or one, because you know like uh, there are no we are not we are ignoring fluctuations of fermions, and so the integral over the integral over the momentum actually just becomes this this difference. All I'm saying is that if I have dp of a phase space density. Uh, and if this thing is zero or one, it's one in the field region and zero outside, this thing just becomes this difference from this picture. Okay. This is the ground state. So ground state sort means that there are a set of Fermi levels which are which are filled on, on both sides. And then I want to get a slightly excited state. An excited state is represented by a little ripple on the on the Fermi level, where I've taken some fermions from the Fermi C and excited them above the Fermi C. And the Hamiltonian, I have a Hamiltonian of the theory, so I can work out uh, how this ripple changes in time. In this classical limit we are considering, this is a very simple thing to do because each fermion has a trajectory. It's like if I take a fermion inside the Fermi C. This has a trajectory which is a hyperbola like this. If I take a, this this object, this has a trajectory like that. So, so you can take each fermion follows its own classical trajectory. You put it together and see how the ripple travels. So let me erase these things. It's not working very well. And the motion of the ripple looks like this. In in the space picture, there is a little excitation coming from minus infinity. It's going to the, the, the top of the potential. It gets reflected back and comes back to infinity. This is the basic scattering in the problem. This ripple is nothing but this is represented by nothing but this massless scalar field in one plus one dimensions. <laughs> So how do we discuss, we want to discuss quantum quench in this model. As always, what we want to do is to make the coupling of the theory time dependent. The theory had a single coupling, which was beta. So I make beta to be a function of time. So I've chosen beta to be some beta naught with some function of time. And the function of time is something which I'll take to asymptote to constant values at early and late times. One can now proceed through all the steps which led to the double scaling limit. And now the double scaling limit is, has to be posed in terms of this overall constant beta naught, which I've written here before, follow through. And the Hamiltonian of the problem is given by this. In this Hamiltonian, what you find that this time dependent function appears both in the kinetic and the potential terms. But this can be simplified by introducing a new time variable, which is given by tau, which is given by this relationship. And in this new time variable, the, the time dependence from the, poten from the kinetic term disappears and only comes in, in the potential terms. So what it becomes, the problem now becomes a problem of fermions in an inverted harmonic oscillator potential with a time dependent frequency. So uh, Shumita, is it kind yeah. of a conformal transformation type of thing? Uh, this thing, of course, yeah. in one dimension, every transformation is a conformal transformation. No, I'm uh, thinking about in a metric, like people used to rescale uh, so that the kinetic term shouldn't be dependent on the factor. So here you yeah, it's sort of like that. Yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So this is the Hamiltonian for the non-relativistic fermions, which we will deal with. <clears throat> A time-dependent harmonic inverted potential means that you know you start with something like this. At a later time, it becomes like that. And another late, and then another later time it goes like this, or it can come back, whatever it wishes to do. 
an analogous problem, of course, you can make this f to be like a theta function, namely suddenly change from one value to another value. That would be an abrupt quench in this problem. An analogous problem in unitary matrix models was first investigated by Gautam Mandal and Takeshi Morita for an abrupt quench. The potential there was a compact version of a right side up harmonic oscillator, like a, like a real harmonic oscillator like this. The motivation in this work was to investigate a possible approach to a generalized Gibbs ensemble for which they found a fair amount of evidence. And uh, there is a recent paper by uh, Kulkarni, Mandal, and Morita, which, uh, which actually uh, uh, you know, builds up on this problem and some very nice results about GGEs. Our interest in this problem is a little bit different. We are interested in the problem as we saw that this is this is a problem uh, this is a model which gives rise to an emergent space and an emergent geometry we would like to learn what kind of emergent geometry does one get by performing this quantum quench so now i'll describe some results which we obtained in this direction with my student sinong liu and our postdoc sean hampton and this is the jhep reference So how do we solve such a problem? So just as the time independent problem, we have to first find the classical saddle point of this collective field theory Hamiltonian of, of the action. So I've written down what is the collective field theory action in this, this time should be tau here, in this, in this new time, and so you can see that, and as you would expect, that the time dependence actually appears right in front of the potential. And then we are going to find the classical saddle point. And then we'll perform fluctuations around the saddle point. And as you would expect, this will give rise to a theory of a massless scalar in some time dependent metric and a time and space dependent couplings, which we would like to learn about. It turns out that there is a very interesting property of this action, which makes it possible to find exact solutions to this problem. And this property can be thought can be uh, thought of as a kind of a canonical transformation. So what you do is introduce a, an auxiliary function, which I call rho of t, and make a change of variables from your original space coordinate x to a new space coordinate y, which mixes up with time in this particular fashion. That's why it's a kind of a canonical transformation. And you define a new time, which is given by this equation. Then it turns out that the original action where there was a time dependent function sitting here becomes an action where that function has completely disappeared provided this auxiliary functions satisfies a non-linear equation, which is a generalization of something called an ermakov pini equation. The ermakov pini equation is an equation where this sign is plus and that sign is plus, but enough things are known about this non-linear equation to allow us a solution to this problem. So as a result, a solution to this equation, if I get a solution to this equation with appropriate initial conditions, will yield a solution to the C equal to one theory with a time dependent coupling in terms of known solutions with a constant coupling. So that is the strategy. I should make a comment here, which will become important, is that this is, of course, a real differential equation, but of course, solutions are not necessarily real. And in fact, what we will find is that we will need to admit complex solutions or real or imaginary solutions of this equation. You can see that if I take rho to i rho, this equation becomes uh, remains invariant. So 
we will need to switch from real to purely imaginary rho of t. But rho of t is just an auxiliary function uh, which is used to obtain the, the solution. The solution for the collective field is always real. So, uh, so mean the, means for this equation, are means exact solutions are known for some particular f of tau or? We found the class of solutions for some f of tau's, which I'll sort of, I'll not give you the solutions, but I'll tell you the f of tau's, which admit some solution. But uh, let me go to the next slides to show what class of f of tau's would admit an exact solution, which could be interesting. Now, uh, I just wanted to mention that this transformation, which I did from x to y and from tau to capital T, is in fact a canonical transformation in the single particle phase space, which can be seen by looking at the equation which is satisfied by the density in phase space. And if you make this canonical transformation, this with that, this brings this equation to that equation where the time dependence has disappeared. The generalized, this generalized uh, ermakov pini equation is the equation of motion of a particle in a time-dependent potential, which is like this. It has a potential which has a rho square piece and then a one upon rho square piece with an overall negative sign. So typically it's a potential which sort of looks like this. It's not the old, uh, not the original inverted harmonic oscillator potential, but it has some common features. If I look at this potential and ask, how do I read off the solution to the time independent problem that would correspond to f of tau being a constant? And clearly that the ground state solution of this the, is given by this rho square given by one upon omega naught. So therefore, we are going to use this as a kind of an initial condition for solution of the time-dependent problem. Namely, in our quaint profiles, we will use functions which asymptote to a constant value of early times. So that equation is something we are going to solve with adiabatic initial conditions, where rho square becomes that constant value at, at, at times and the time derivative is the time derivative which is predicted by the adiabatic solution. And then we'll see what happens. Once we find the solution for rho, we can go back and write down the solution for the collective fields, which I have written out here. This is the space derivative and the time derivative. And one can check, of course, that this solution satisfies the necessary condition, con the consistency condition that the time and space derivatives should commute with each other. So now we have obtained the background solutions if we are able to solve that, that ermakov pini equation. So we proceed as usual in, and, and uh, perturbatively, namely you expand around the background solution and then you write down what is the quadratic action and the cubic action. The quadratic action is uh, the action of a massless scalar in the background matrix, which is conformable to this metric, which you can see is time dependent because all these things are time dependent. But of course, you cannot know what the conformal factor is by just looking at this metric because a massless scalar in one plus one dimension is conformally invariant. So you can only know the conformal class of this background metric. The cubic part of the of the action is very complicated, but nevertheless, you can write this thing down. And these are the expressions which we will need to figure out the features of the emergent space-time dual to our quantum quench. So how do we solve the ermakov pini equation? There is a remarkable fact, the reason for which, which I don't know, and this remarkable fact I think has been known for a very long time, is that the solution of that non-linear equation can be obtained, in fact, from solutions of a linear equation. So namely, this rho of tau 
which is the object which appears in this generalized Ermakov PD equation, can be written in this following form. In terms of two functions, u of tau and v of tau, which are the linearly independent solutions of this equation. And if you look at this equation, this is nothing but the classical equation of motion of one particle moving in this time dependent inverted oscillator potential. There are some constants here, and you can show that this actually solves the Ermakov Pini equation if this constant satisfies a certain Ronskian condition, which is given by this. These were facts which were known for the ermakov pini equation, which was for a real right side up harmonic oscillator. And this, is, uh, this has been used in the past to, to look at, uh, you know, look at behaviors of uh, harmonic oscillators with time dependent frequency and we had used this fact for you know the critical quench problem which i talked about for n non-relativistic fermions in a harmonic trap which could be of even of some experimental interest but we are going to use it for a different different reason namely to look at the nature of the emergent geometries okay so we start by looking at smooth quenches, where the frequency smoothly interpolates between some constant values, omega naught and omega one. It is not very hard to see that regardless of how slow we perform this time violation, variation, adiabaticity will always be broken at some finite time. This is different for a right side up harmonic oscillator. And it is related to the fact that the right side up harmonic oscillator has an energy gap, whereas the inverted harmonic oscillator doesn't have an energy gap. And as a result, uh, you can, the adiabaticity is always broken at some time. And you can do an analysis uh, and a slightly more uh, mathematical analysis to show that this will always happen. But this can be seen uh, from a very qualitative an analysis of the analog problem which is involved in solving from rho square. So this is, I've written down the, the generalized ermakov pini equations, which is sitting here with, with this kind of potential. And now, and now make some very sort of uh, the qualitative uh, analysis of a particle moving in such a potential. So here are the pictures. So suppose I have a potential, uh, this potential, uh, and I start out with at some value of the time, tau, where the potential is this red curve. And then I look at, at some later time, tau plus d tau, where the potential is given by the blue curve. Now, if adiabaticity was valid, then what would happen is that if I started out with this analog particle at the unstable equilibrium point of the old potential, namely at this dotted line, then it would remain close to the unstable equilibrium point at the potential at some late time. So, so I, I looked at the time tau and looked at, at an infinitesimally later time tau plus d tau and see where this particle is in, the, in that new potential. The particle is a little bit away from the, the unstable equilibrium point of the new potential. It is on this side or in this, in this case, it's on the other side, depending on whether you have increased the frequency a little bit or decrease the frequency a little bit. However, by looking at this problem, it will soon become clear that unless, now, so what will happen? Of course, at this point, there is a time derivative of rho because it started with some initial time derivative of rho. So the particle is moving this way or that way, depending on, depending on, on whether it is this picture or that, 
this picture or that picture. And so, in a generic situation, this particle will either fall in this direction or fall in this case or go in that direction and away from the equilibrium point. There are, of course, extremely fine tuned velocities such that the velocity is such that this particle can creep up and again approach this equilibrium point of the new potential, which would represent the adiabatic, basically the adiabatic solution. So what this means is that unless I have an extremely fine-tuned initial condition, if I start with generic adiabatic initial conditions, the, the adiabaticity is bound to be broken at some time. This can be seen for a class of quench profiles where the problem can be solved exactly in terms of special functions. So in answer to Deep Tarko's question about uh, how do I know for what functions I can solve the problem? So what I showed is that if I can solve this problem, which is the which is just the classical problem uh, in an inverted harmonic oscillator potential, if that problem is exactly solvable, then our problem is also exactly solvable. So that's what we. So there are a whole class of such problems which are which are known. So I've just picked one of them. I've taken uh, taken a function. Which, which sort of either goes like this blue line or goes like this red line, depending on whether the frequency at late times is larger or smaller than the frequency at earlier times. And I've plotted in this other plot uh, the solution for this rho square together with the adiabatic solutions. And as you can see, it's, it's regardless of what, whatever the value of this rate, which is delta t, at some point, the solution departs from the adiabatic solution as shown here. But that will mean that you, are, uh, you started with the definition of t or something which was an integral with one over rho square. So that will diverge. Uh, if, if rho goes to zero. Yeah. Yeah. We will deal with that case soon. I see. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Interestingly, when I go from a larger frequency to a smaller frequency, this rho square of t vanishes at some finite time tau, and this will play an important role in what follows. Now, since adiabaticity is broken anyway, if you want to look at the late time behavior, it is adequate to look at abrupt quench when the solutions are in fact quite trivial. So we are going to look at abrupt quenches, which look like this or that. And the solution can be almost written down on a half a page. And this is the solution. And again, once I know the solution for rho, I know the solutions for this collective fields. OK. So let's look at what these solutions look like. They're pretty much like the smooth quench solutions. So when the frequency increases, so we are looking at kind of a single step at this moment, with the frequency increases, which is this green line here, then rho square increases monotonically to plus infinity. When the frequency decreases, rho square vanishes at some time tau equal to tau naught, which is determined by this equation. At this point, a lot of things diverge. The, the space derivative and the time derivative of the collective field diverge. If I were thinking of solving the classical equations of motion of the collective field theory, the any further time evolution will be um, will be ambiguous there is no way to predict the further time evolution on ambiguous in fact from the point of view of those differential equations which determine the collective field this looks like a singularity it will turn out that this is not a singularity this is a problem of 
the way we define the collective field, namely the, the description of the theory in terms of the bosonic variables, in fact, fails at this point. And to see this, what is really going on, we need to go back to the fermionic description. The fermionic description is written in, uh, is drawn in terms of the single particle phase space of fermions. So this is a picture. You start at tau equal to zero. This is an abrupt quench at tau equal to zero. You, and then you, uh, this is the red line. The, the dashed things are the branch of this hyperbola, which if you sort of lie on positive P for the left-hand side and negative P for the right-hand side. And the successive curves, the blue and the black and the green are the Fermi surfaces at subsequent times for tau greater than zero. What you find by looking at this, as well as looking at solutions of the evolution of the phase space density, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the time evolution at tau equal to tau zero. In fact, if you trace individual fermions, they smoothly travel as if nothing has happened. The thing that happens at tau equal to tau zero is that this branch of the, of the Fermi C Act actually becomes parallel to the p axis. So, therefore, if I were trying to define a collective field by drawing a, a constant line, which has somewhere here, no, I don't have a constant line. If I drew a constant x line, and the difference of this point and that point is a space derivative, that thing blows up. So, that is not a good definition anymore. So what do we do for tau greater than tau zero? It turns out that for this regime, so of course, what happens for tau greater than tau zero, the fermions cross to the other side. The fermions which were originally in the positive x side have crossed over to the negative x side, is that's shown in the green line. The fermions which were in the negative x side have crossed over to the positive x side. You know, the quench, has excited a bunch of fermions which have crossed the hump of the potential. In fact, it turns out that for tau greater than tau zero, you can define a new bosonic field, which is obtained by not taking differences like this, but taking a difference which is like this. You take the difference of this and that, that quantity also satisfies the exact collective field equations of motion. This is defined out here. And that is what the fermionic theory telling you of how to continue the time evolution across tau equal to tau zero. So just to recap, if we just had the classical bosonic formulation, that formulation becomes ambiguous at this time. However, this bosonic formulation is a rewriting of uh, underlying fermionic theory, which is very well defined, and it instructs you how to patch a solution uh, of the collective field from tau less than tau zero to tau greater than tau zero. So, so with the so, yeah. so the fermions, uh, they have gone over the hump, or have they I mean, tunnel through the? No, this is a this is purely at the classical level. They're actually gone over the hump. And so, so the, these are also there in the equilibrium problem. These kind of uh, means one can have highly excited modes which do this. Yes, certainly. I mean, even in the you can certainly have fermions which are excited high enough that go uh, across these things, and um, you know they they mean whatever they mean. I mean, it's nothing very special about them. But in this case, uh, the significance is that uh, this kind of quench uh, almost inevitably leads you to uh, this, this fermion being excited enough. It's sort of tied to this, this, this gross violation of adiabaticity in the problem. There is a, uh, there's a, uh, curiosity, which I don't completely understand, uh, which is sort of related to some of my own earlier work in the subject. 
earlier, people that looked at time dependent solutions uh, of, of the collective field theory uh, pioneered by the work of Kartmarek and Straubinger, which were called matrix cosmologies. They were called cosmologies because they were time dependent backgrounds. But these were solutions of the problem with constant couplings, but time dependent solutions, so excited states of the theory. And it turns out they are obtained from the ground state by a, a, a certain spectrum generating algebra of the theory called W infinity algebra. And some of those solutions which I had looked at in collaboration with uh, Joanna Karchmarek in the past are in fact very similar to the solutions which, have, which we obtained from quantum quench. I'm not sure why this happens, but there must be, must be some simple reason. I should make uh, a comment about finite n. The pictures which I've drawn are strictly in the double scaling limit where n is infinite. These pictures have some modifications for finite n. And the reason why there has to be modifications for finite n is the following. Recall, we started with a potential which had a quadratic piece and a quadratic piece. And in this double scaling limit, the quadric piece just dropped off, which can be seen by going to these rescale coordinate x. However, when this rescale coordinate x becomes very large, this is the x coordinate on which the fermions are moving, large of the order of square root of beta, you can see that the quadric term becomes as important as the quadratic term. So this is very, very far from the hump of the potential because beta, recall, is proportional to n, is n upon g. So when x becomes of the order of square root of n, you have to take into account the quadric part of the potential. And, then, and one way to do that is to replace the original potential by a hard wall at large x. So the potential actually become something like this. This is the nice regulated potential. You can numerically work out how the Fermi surfaces now behave in such a case. The qualitative features are not that different, but of course n is finite, so the total number uh, is finite, so the total volume uh, enclosed in the Fermi surfaces is finite. So this is a representative picture of what happens. This is before the quench, and then as time proceeds, you can see that the thing deforms. And you know, this, this is the time you know, where the Fermi surface, one branch of the Fermi surface becomes parallel to the p-axis. And this is after the fermions have spilled over to the other side. The qualitative aspects are, are, do not change because of this, of this reason. You can all, also explore quenches with multiple steps. Here is an example. You have a, a series of abrupt quenches where the frequency first goes down and then goes up. And you know, this is a picture of what the solution of rho square looks like. It turns out generically, this quantity rho square becomes either plus infinity or minus infinity. There are, however, very finely tuned quenches which reach to a constant and finite rho square at late times. And this is an example where you can, you can choose this time interval between these two steps given by this formula. And then what you find this rho square actually becomes a constant finite values at, at late times. We will see that this is qualitatively different. The kind of space time this will lead to are qualitatively different from the generic case where rho square blows up. Let me shut down this whole. Okay. So now we come to the punchlines about emergent space time. 
So let me explain a little motivation of why we are interested in knowing about this emergent spacetime. It is well known that two-dimensional Didaton gravity and two-dimensional string theory has black hole solutions. In fact, in Euclidean signature, Witten wrote down a wall sheet theory, uh, which, uh, which represents the Euclidean black hole. So it's an exact string theory, uh, black hole background for string theory. This has, there's a lot of work in the Lorenzian signature as well, which is subtle. But nevertheless, it is believed that there are exact black hole backgrounds in two-dimensional string theory. However, there is good reason to believe that these black holes are not contained in the singlet sector of the C equal to 1 model, which we have been dealing with. In fact, uh, some time ago, Kartsmarek, Maldasena, and Strominger did the following problem. They took a, this massless tachyon pulse from infinity, moving towards the hump of the potential, and solved the collective equations and found what happens. What they found is that uh, this pulse, in fact, goes to the hump of the potential and reflects back and without forming any black hole. It has got to do with the, put, with the fact that the, 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 the depth of the Fermi C is, in fact, finite. And by the time the hump reaches, uh, the pulse reaches the hump, it actually feels the bottom of that Fermi C and gets reflected back. Now, there is a possibility which people have considered that this black hole lives in the non-singlet sector of the theory. Uh, uh, there's this conjecture of Kazakov, Kostov, and Kudasov. Uh, and even this was, I don't know, 15 years ago, but people still don't know whether, uh, whether this is really right. So we will stay in the singlet picture. So, uh, the, singlet. Yeah. Sorry. If, if if there was a black hole formation, then what would be expected from the from this smaller sena Kurzmarek Strominger calculation? So in in the collective theory, what you would expect is that the fluctuation sort of move in a background, uh, which uh, which will be like a black hole background, and the coupling would be like the dilaton of the of the two D black holes. So there would I mean if the wave happened. if the wave approaches, there would be some kind of red shift and. Yes, you will you'll find a large time delay, and you know, uh, and those are the things. An infinite time delay for horizon is formed, and one didn't actually find that. Nice. Okay. Now I mentioned that in generic quantum quenches in ADS CFT, generically a black hole is formed, which is uh, which is the description of thermalization. So if a black hole is not formed, we would like to know what does the late time space time look like? <clears throat> so here we have some exploratory results. So let me remind you that once you find the collective field, you, you can write down the metric which is perceived by these fluctuations up to a conformal factor. But that is okay because we want to draw Penrose diagrams for motions of these little pulses of this massless field. And for that, uh, it is good enough. Since generically, adiabaticity is always broken, we will draw these diagrams using the, the simpler abrupt quench results. Now to draw these diagrams, as always, it is useful to find coordinates such that the metric is first conformal to Minkowski spacetime, and then one makes the standard, you know, the the ten transformation to compactify infinity and draw a Penrose diagram. <clears throat> Let us look at what is this transformation uh, which makes this metric into a standard Minkowski metric. <clears throat> this transformation is given by something which we had used before. Remember, we had used some coordinate called Q, in which it, uh, it became transparent 
that the the field we are talking is talking about is a massless field and it is related by this namely this metric becomes a standard mean Koskian metric with some constant outside. The Penrose diagram for this is a boring two-dimensional space, which has two sides, which are divided by this black line, which corresponds to Q equal to zero, or X equal to one upon square root of omega naught, which is that, <coughs> which is the place <coughs> where, where the Fermi surface intersects the potential. And pulses comes from scry minus and proceeds to scry plus by reflection from this point. It is the S matrix of such, uh, such a reflection, which is encoded in the string theory S matrix <coughs> of the S matrix of the two dimensional non critical string theory. For a time dependent solutions, we know what these things are. So we might try to find what are the analogs of these Minkowskian coordinates. For a single step abrupt quench, when omega naught is smaller than omega one, it is easy to find this and I've written this thing down, down there. But this has a very peculiar property. The peculiar property is given by this equation, <clears throat> where you see as the matrix model time goes over the range from zero to infinity, the time, this Minkowskian time T, capital T, goes over a finite range from zero to this tan hyperbolic inverse of omega naught by omega one. So normally, if I were to draw a Penrose diagram, this would be like a geodesically incomplete space and one would extend the space time beyond this time. However, now the space time is emergent. The underlying physics is given by the matrix model. So there is a preferred time, <coughs> which is, remember this was a non-relativistic theory to begin with. There is a preferred time, which is tau. And in this time of the matrix model, when this happens, this tau has become infinity. So there is no meaning of a further time evolution beyond this end of time. As a result, you would draw a Penrose diagram, which actually has a space-like boundary. We can now go ahead and calculate the cubic couplings at this end of time. It turns out that these cubic couplings, in fact, diverge. What this means is that, so this line is tau equal to plus infinity or t equal to, uh, sorry, tau equal to plus infinity at t at some finite value. This is, uh, you know, drawn by making the standard transformations. Having a cubic coupling diverge means the semi-classical description we are using down, we have been using breaks down here. To find out what really happens, one needs to look at exact solutions of the fermion field theory, which we haven't done, but what should it should be possible to do. For omega naught greater than omega one, that parametrization we talked about works for tau less than tau zero, tau zero. Uh, what was tau zero? Tau zero was, you know, this time where, uh, you know, rho square crosses a zero. This is the time as I think Kaushik pointed out, this, this time variable, the new time variable would become singular. Indeed, at this time, this capital time becomes infinity. So this Minkowski time ends at some finite matrix model time. However, we found that in the matrix model or equivalent the Fermion theory, nothing special is happening at this time. The, 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 the theory proceeds in its time evolution smoothly across this time. And therefore, 
and we found that we need to go to a different mat. This is sort of like singularity rather than uh, a real singularity. So we need to find what are the set of Minkowski and coordinates <coughs> for tau greater than tau zero, which can be found. And pretty much like the uh, earlier case, yes? Uh, yeah, so, uh, um, uh, so what you said is it's like going to a patch, it's more like uh, going to a uh, changing a branch. It is sort of like changing a branch. I mean, I'll show yeah. a picture. So do, you, do, you, do you expect something like a, something to jump discreetly, like in any uh, changing a branch, going from one branch to another across a cut? Uh, it's not really, because uh, what is happening is that the parametrization theory of the theory in terms of the bosonic variables is becoming bad. But nothing happens nothing but, uh, but still you important. still you continue to use the fact that x is still the space which is we claim here you claim to be emergent so we still keep on interpreting x as the space only say that time is ill-defined no uh, actually oh, that that story is also not quite true x yeah. x is one of the coordinates and i i didn't go over that you know in this picture these dotted lines are lines of constant x yeah and you find that in this region x is actually not a space coordinate this dotted line is not ah, okay. a time like line I see, I see i see i see so it actually becomes null at that point yeah so that th that is why this thing is happening of course the signature of the metric always remains minus 1 but it says what ah. you called x was not doesn't always remain a space uh, uh, as a space coordinate <laughs> I see. Uh, okay. If you didn't know that this comes from a fermion theory, you wouldn't really know what to do because you know, as you said, it's, yes. a, it's a going to a different so, branch. So you are, so so you are saying that when we try to interpret this theory physically, we always fall back to the fermionic description. Absolutely, because that's the non-singular description, right? Okay. And then you invent this thing to obtain a space-time interpretation. Okay. Okay. So as I said, and I'm almost uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, uh, at the time when tau goes to infinity, this new Minkowskian time has gone to a finite value. And once again, at this finite time, the coupling becomes large and the semi-classical description breaks down. So this is pretty much like a space-like singularity in the semi-classical theory. The Penrose diagram is a bit complicated. You know, these are these are I have to attach, I have to identify parts of the Penrose diagram. You know, this is the line tau equal to tau zero, which has to be identified out here, and that all can be done. So, what I wanted to emphasize there is that the uh, actually, if I may, uh, this picture exactly looks like branch uh, changing branch. If you uh, try to patch these two diamonds at the at the at the junction point. That's right. I mean, these dotted black lines are identified. You know, yeah, if you do that, that's about. exactly like changing branches in a Brillo zone kind of a thing. Uh, possibly. I, I haven't thought about from that angle. Okay. So what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, in this model and possibly in you know many other models of holography, you know, something like the BFSS model would be actually similar. There is a fundamental description in terms of in terms of you know matrices, partons, or what have you, and in that description, <clears throat> uh, it's not a it's very often not a relativistic description. It, it's something else, you know. It's a the relativistic description is somehow emergent. It sort of comes as a as a way. Of, as a in an in an approximation in this case that approximation is the is the classical approximation to the collective field and it is in terms of this approximate description that we think of it as a connection to the low energy uh, dynamics of two dimensional strings so there is a low energy effective theory which of these massless uh, field or the tachyon 
And this, in this low energy effective theory is breaking down at a time and there is no notion of going beyond that time. So far as the low energy theory is concerned. So this is pretty much like what uh, space-like cosmological singularities would appear in a low energy effective theory of gravity. Namely, the, the, the gr equations of motion uh, would, uh, the solutions cannot be continued across this point, but typically the equations themselves become unreliable at this point. And that is exactly uh, the signature of that is this couplings becoming very large. Finally, we could have this finely tuned quenches, which I talked about with multiple steps. The result of that is quite boring and the resulting geometry is actually smooth and the Penrose diagram is pretty much like the diagram of two dimensional Minkowski space. But that's only in these very special finely tuned quenches. So to summarize, we found that for generic quantum quenches, the emergent geometry has space-like boundaries with strong coupling. That doesn't mean that the theory becomes singular. What it means is that the description of the theory in terms of these collective fields becomes singular. So they are pretty much like singularities in effective field theories. What this signifies is that the semi-classical description, which is, which is essential in a space-time interpretation of the theory, is breaking down. To determine if the singularity is resolved or not, we need to solve the fermionic theory exactly. And I suspect that an exact solution of the fermionic theory, you'll probably find nothing is singular. But we haven't done that. As, as I said, we haven't done that, but one may be able to determine this in some definitive fashion. It's only for very finely tuned quenches we end up with the smooth space times where the semi classical description never breaks down. Our discussion has been entirely in the context of the matrix model and its dual description in terms of collective field theory. We found that, however, there are situations where this description fails and one needs to constantly go back to the fermionic description to continue time evolution. This was this change across tau equal to tau naught. The low energy dual description is in fact dilaton gravity coupled to this massless tachyon. It would be interesting to investigate that if these time dependent backgrounds appear as solutions of this low energy theory, or perhaps one requires backgrounds of the higher string modes. In the two dimensional theory, these higher string modes are not propagating modes, but they can have non trivial backgrounds, in which case one would really need a string field theory, you know, a good string field theory to, to describe these classical solutions. And in view of recent work in this field, that even that may very well be possible. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So uh, we, we have to thank the Professor Sumit Ranjan Dash for giving such a nice talk. And please give uh, unmute yourself and give a clap for him. Now, uh, you guys, please ask questions because this is the discussion session after the talk. So you can f uh, feel free to ask any question to him. Okay, I, I actually have a question. Please ask. Uh, so, uh, it, you, you are, you are uh, starting with a matrix model, you always get the uh, world sheet string theory. So what will be the target space of string theory in this description? Oh, so this is the target space. I mean, the 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 the, 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 the target space has one time and one space. Yeah. The space comes from the Louisville mode of of the two D string. Yeah, but in that case, how will I generalize to higher dimensions? Because uh, this is this space is coming out of this uh, of the eigenvalues of the right. matrix. So, uh, I sort of. Uh, 
a, a higher dimensional analog of this, which cannot be worked out to the the mm -hmm. to the level of satisfaction as this low dimensional example, or the matrix yeah. theory of the BFSS type. Yeah, this, this, one this is more like IKKT, yeah. Huh? This is more like IKKT. No, the no, 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 no. no, no, no. There is a time. The time is always there. This is ah, like, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. like BFSS. But of course, in yeah. BFSS, you know, things and are if not I, if I, Right, but if I could actually do something like in something higher dimension, uh, I will lose this um, hyperbola. So it will become something like hyperbola, and I will lose these branches, right? Well, it wouldn't become, to begin with, it wouldn't become such a simple theory of fermions. Oh. It will I see. become quite complicated. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And mm. those are, of course, super symmetric theories. Um, in, so there uh. will be additional things there. Right. I also put attention, you use AGM uh, formalism. Uh, my question uh, did you consider uh, orthonormal basis? Uh, orthonormal basis for what? Uh, to, to make measurement of uh, uh, distance and time uh, is good idea to use of or, or normal basis uh, because no. uh, it will be right. It will so be of course, uh, I mean, when we go to the final interpretation, we actually use uh, coordinates which become locally Minkowskian. So that. So there, this capital T and Q are these orthonormal bases. Uh -huh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, I mean, uh, can means is there an interpretation of the uh, setup where tau, the matrix model, time is periodic? Means if uh, means can can one discuss thermal quenches in this model? Um, uh, I. You mean uh, like a harmonic, uh, like a uh, harmonically driven uh, system? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, the matrix model time is 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 compactified. So. Oh, I see. Uh, Euclidean. 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 Yes. Euclidean. Yes. So, um, uh, so that, uh, so that uh, would be at uh, a theory at finite temperature. Yes. And. And of course, people have looked at that, and there is an interesting story there. It turns out <clears throat> that uh, when that uh, the circle radius becomes small enough, uh, the non-singlet fields start. You know, like if you if you, if we really take the ungauged model, the non-singlet fields uh, start contributing, and that's usually. Uh, identified with the Hagedon transition of the string theory. So one, one can't study the singlet model with, uh, you, with, with this Euclidean? Hagedon. Yeah, one, one, can, one can study the singlet model with the, with the, in Euclidean time. Uh, that uh, doesn't give anything much interesting and there's no phase transition as I know of. I mean, it's, uh, you know, massless scalars in, at a finite temperature. And in fact, uh, uh, treating that singlet model at finite temperature was a big clue for us when we uh, first interpreted this model as a two-dimensional string theory. You know, because you get a you get an expression for the for the free energy as a function of the temperature, and the fact that the free energy actually went linear in the the log of the partition function went linear with temperature was the first clue that this is actually a two-dimensional model and not a one-dimensional model. I see, and but but that that the target space interpretation of that has no has no black holes. So, so. No, no, not that I know of. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, many people, including me, have made attempts to you know to to sort of invent black holes in the singlet sector. I think they are all wrong. <clears throat> Any further question, please ask.
Anybody have any question? Rocky, do you want to ask any question? Well, I I don't uh, have a question. I, I, I just do not understand a tiny thing, uh, which is insignificant, which was at, at the beginning you were uh, considering this uh, penny, penny equation, right? Can you please go 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 back to the slide yeah. where yeah, where you yeah. first first write down the action? Just one second. This one, right? Yeah, you you may mentioned something like that. This has uh, complex complex solutions, whereas uh, actually, uh, uh, what we are interested in either real or purely imaginary. Okay. So I I, I was one wondering about the hermeticity uh, and and stuff like that. Whoa. So yeah, have you checked? That it can be written in a Schrodinger form or not? In 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 a. Uh, so this can be written in a Schrodinger form. Though that is the potential. Uh, and whether the right hand side side is an Hermitian operator or not? If if that's a Hermitian operator, then then it can uh, either be real, real or imaginary. Depending if you have a well, I so the the Schrodinger yeah. form the reason I'm why I'm hesitating is this <clears throat> yeah but you know this potential is this famous one upon rho square at yeah rho equal to zero yeah it's a potential like this and uh, so so there are a lot of subtleties with these potentials right because you can have a uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of potential. I'm not sure about the coefficient. When the coefficient exceeds some value, this is doesn't remain self-adjoint. So that's why I'm hesitating uh, a little bit. Uh, I haven't checked uh, whether uh, the coefficient here actually exceeds that value or not. Uh, but I think I. Um, let me see. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think. I mean, it certainly has the feature that a particle can reach this rho equal to zero in a finite time. Whatever that means. I don't know. We, we haven't really looked at this because this equation doesn't have much of its significance in the problem. It's a kind of a crutch to obtain solutions. I mean, the, the collective field Hamiltonian is omission. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. okay. No, uh, uh, anybody have any question like Sh Shamikda? Do you have any question? not anything immediately actually <laughs> yeah. so any student like abhinash shubham anybody not really no okay anyway i think people are tired so am i yeah okay so uh, thank you for giving this nice talk and it will be uploaded in uh, YouTube and I will share the channel link with you. Okay. And uh, the next talk will be given by Cle uh, Igor Klevanov on SYK models and tensor models. So let's see you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Stay safe. Yeah, stay you, safe. You yeah, too. Stay safe, right. Yeah. Um, Particularly, Bye. India seems to heading to a pretty bad shape. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.